In this video, I'm testing this 1960 Austin Westminster A99. Uh, let's see how it goes. Now, obviously, before we go for a drive, we must talk a bit about what it is and why it is. Uh, it is a A99 Westminster. It was the effectively the second generation of Westminster. The first one started with the cow-hipped version, but looked like a bigger version of the A50 Cambridge I drove um, a few months ago. And that kind of evolved into slightly facelift versions. But for 1959, they completely reworked the car uh, with the um, kind assistance of um, Pininfarina for the styling, which is why the styling looks like a lot of Italian cars at times, very much, well, not just Italian, the Peugeot 404 also has a very similar vibe going on. You will notice the A99 has these sort of very flashy headlamp, side lamp units, um, which were very much um, copied, or not copied, but the, the, the same as the little A40 Farina. So that was the tie-in. Uh, I think eventually they decided it was a bit too much of a tie-in with the cheap economy model. And they revised the styling just two years later. Um, um, different style, got rid of a bit more of the chrome um, for the um, A110 Westminster, which I have to admit is probably my favorite of the Westminsters. But yeah, very, very classic styling unfortunately very very classic sort of you know 1950s styling but this is a car that was in production um in this shape from 1959 until 1968 so this was trying to sell alongside stuff like the um rover p6 and the triumph 2000 albeit this was more for your you know your, your chief exec um, and they were a slightly more traditional sort of a buyer perhaps um, but there we go, it's a Westminster, we've got overdrive. Uh, as far as I can tell, this was um, a uh, car built in Longbridge in the UK. Uh, I think some of the smaller Austins were assembled here in New Zealand. These were also assembled in Australia. I don't think this one was. Um, it's a little hard to tell. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with these cars to be able to say, oh, that's definitely um, a feature from one built in Sydney. Um, oh, apparently I can't get in. That's quite interesting. I don't think the door is locked, because that's the door locked there. So that's locked. That should be open. Uh, joy of old cars, eh? Hmm. Let's just give this door a slam. No. Right, okay. Um... Let me try and fix the door. Yeah, well, something's broken there because that is behaving like it's locked now. Um, I could try it with a key, I suppose. I've wound the window down now for safety. Uh, is that the key? Oh, there we go. I somehow managed to lock it without the key. That's, I'll keep the key on me. But yeah, as you can hear, everything is very solid. Uh, good old clunks going on. We've got a um, little door pocket there. A lovely bit of patination going on there. It's an amazing colour, this car. Got these beautiful period um, seat covers covering the um, vinyl. I mean, that might be a clue. I would have expected leather um, in a UK-built one. But again, I, I'm not really familiar enough with these cars. Uh, the steering wheel is absolutely enormous. Uh, it is huge. There is a fantastic horn. There is this little um, indicator switch which sadly on the right side doesn't seem to want to stay there um, it should self-cancel that seems a little over aggressive but this huge um, executive car there's not an awful lot going on here so i shall take you through the controls i'll just close the door uh, and hope i can get out again uh, we have three pedals on the floor for this is a manual and it's a column gear change here um, that's first gear towards and down and then let it pop back, go up into second, and down into third. And there's more European influence here. This was an all-new gearbox, uh, three-speed unit, which is obviously taking up most of the space down here, um, but with um, Porsche Synchromesh. Um, Porsche, not just builder of sports cars, done a lot of consulting work, and they were one of the first to develop a really good, I think it was Bulkring Synchromesh, and that was used on all three 
speeds. Um, so it's a three speed all synchro gearbox. It's a bit weird because the predecessor um, Westminster's had a four speed column gear change and the A110 had a four speed floor change. So this was a brief spell of doing a three speed. I'm not quite sure why they did. But um, for extra ratios, we've got overdrive, which you push in to engage or, or pull out. And it's actually um, uh, a system that um, in engages only under light throttle. So if you accelerate in second or third, when you've got that engaged, it should change ratio. And uh, that should allow for better cruising. Uh, Kia Rio has just invaded my little um, video location here. Um, so we've also got an additional switch that someone seems to have added on the column, which the owner thinks might be related to the overdrive as well. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe it's an an manual override for that opt-in, opt-out. I don't know. Um, over here, we have uh, a hidden switch down here for the heater fan. One speed heater fan. Uh, you know, all the generosity here. We have a switch I can't work out, but I think might be panel lights. And that's your main two position side light and headlight switch. And then we've got the wiper switch for normal and high speeds. Uh, there is a separate button under here for the wash. Uh, so yeah, you have to know your way around. Nothing is labeled, uh, which I find absolutely hilarious. Uh, we've got oil pressure, um, temperature and fuel down here. A 120 mile an hour speedo is a bit optimistic. Um, but is nonetheless fitted. There is a choke and in best BMC stroke BML, BL tradition there is a clothes peg which the owner has tried to colour match to the car. This lovely period um, radio. Um, I don't think it actually works um, but uh, I wonder if it's got another head unit hidden somewhere because I mean it's got speakers that look pretty decent but I can't believe they work with this stereo. Lovely. Oh, and there we go. Uh, J Ingram and Co Limited, Austin Dealers, the original dealer sticker. So it was sold new in Nelson down on the South Island. Um, very strange sort of globed clock. That doesn't look like a UK thing. In fact, it says Japan. So um, I wonder if that's an aftermarket item. Um, the perspex and screws lead me to believe it might be. Uh, heat controls, I'm guessing that's for hot and colder. And that's for where you want it to go. Um, doesn't make any sense, boost, demist, whatever. Um, all a bit strange. A little trip down here to reset the trip. Uh, a little button even. But yeah, a fair bit of space. We On these enormous seats, we've got little pull-down armrests. Um, which, um, that doesn't look like it should do. That looks like that should come with it. So we'll just put that there and pretend it didn't happen. Maybe we'll try the other one. There we go, that's what's meant to happen. Fold out like that. Uh, maybe that one's seen a bit too much um, of life. Uh, we've got modern seat belts which look a bit out of place but add a degree of safety. Similarly, we've got these rather ungainly plastic door mirrors which very much remind me of my aunt's Morris Oxford Series 6 when I was growing up in the 80s. She had very similar mirrors fitted. And again, they don't look great but they do boost your vision somewhat otherwise you're relying on this somewhat wobbly internal mirror um, dainty little sun visors they must get quite a lot of use in this country you would have thought um, some very tired trim on the sides but yeah that's the front magnificent carpet let's jump in the rear now there's not so much space in the back as you might expect it's a little tight for leg room with a seat set for me and uh, that was something they addressed with the 110 uh, Westminster it had a bit more wheelbase for a bit more space here in the back it's not suitably ministerial with um, such cramped conditions and uh, that was something they accepted little ashtrays I remember those from my aunt's and Morris Oxford um, very similar but again the construction leads me to think maybe not British maybe this was uh, a Sydney assembled car um, but um, yeah it's quite patinated in here you know it's not perfect condition but um, I like that. It, it shows the age of the car. It, it's not restored. This is exactly how it is. And uh, all the better for it, I think. So here is the big C-Series um, straight six engine, 2,912cc. Um, distributor here, alternator, quite posh. No power steering on this example. I think it was um, optional on the later 110. Um, 
Interesting remote servo setup. This is actually a Japanese one off a Toyota, apparently. And um, some interesting um, Kiwi engineering going on here, but it appears to work. Apparently, it's been like that for a very long time. And there is the cooling fan with its noisy blades. Some interesting noises coming from somewhere, but I'm sure it's fine and not necessarily about to explode. Haha, -ha, a clue. Uh, this key was definitely made in Australia. It's just visible on the rim. It looks like it's been cut into, and I suspect that's just to try and um, identify it, because that is the boot key, so it makes it easier to find. Um, now this boot, that was apparently unlocked. Um, it doesn't seem to want to let us in. Uh, we may not get to see the boot. Yeah, that's, um, oh, there we go, gosh. And there we go, we have, um, a fair sized boot, um, flat floor. So I wonder if the spare tire is um, underneath. Is that an underslung item? No, that's all petrol tank. Interesting, I wonder where the spare tire lives. Uh, maybe it was just chucked in back here, I don't know. Uh, we can see, it's like the fuel filter is here at the back. And uh, yeah, more t fuel tank under there maybe. Uh, a few tools, there's a, the filler coming down from a separate little flap, and uh, yeah, very metal in here. Oh, that's interesting, we've got a little boot light. Oh, and it works. Magnificent, that looks like a proper lash up, I love it. Right, let's slam. Oh, I did say it needs a proper slam, uh, I might not have the technique. There we go, hopefully that will do it. I'll we'll keep an eye on my mirrors and make sure it doesn't pop up as we're driving along. Uh, oh, locked me out again. Right, let's see if we can get set up and we'll take this um, old beauty for a drive. Full of character though, isn't she? Oh, I can hear that clock ticking away, it's marvelous. Right, um, just check we're in neutral. And the big old six-cylinder engine fires into life. Um, like the A50 Cambridge I drove, um, this feels very much um, set for um, hotter climates. It's a very noisy engine fan. I suspect it's got extra blades compared to what they would have fitted in the UK, which is why you can hear the... Really can hear a lot of um, fan noise um, over the top. But um, enough waffle. Uh, we shall engage first. I'll just demonstrate the indicators. There you go. So that actually flashes to tell me the indicator's going, and it should self-cancel. There we go, perfect. Right, we're in first. Handbrake is to my right and is now off. Uh, we shall do a little wiperage, if I remember which switch it is. There we go. and uh, they don't park quite down at the bottom of the screen. Good overlap, no triangle of doom. Um, they don't do a brilliant job of cleaning the windscreen, but um, better than nothing. Twirl the big wheel. And away we go. So it's the same engine in effect, uh, as the uh, Austin Healey. Uh, I think we were up to 103 brake horsepower by the time these came out. But really, it's all about the torque. White point's very high on the clutch, might not have all that much life left in it. Steering wheel rim is slightly cracked, not all that comfortable on the fingers. But yeah, she certainly pulls well lusty lusty engines and uh, make a great noise as well uh, no intermittent wiper of course and that pause is because they um, stop in a different place when they're operating to when they're actually going along uh, sadly I've got to hold the indicator on the right or it just stops oh It's a nicer column shift than the four speed, but it's still not one to really rush. 
We're going to find some faster roads so I can demonstrate the um, overdrive. I'll get used to that clutch in a minute. Reasonably good brakes. Uh, we've finally got. Um, whoa! Finally got the disc brakes with this ex example. The switch gear is a little hard to reach with the um, static seat belts. It probably wouldn't have had any seat belts fitted when it was new. So if I push that in, then the overdrive should automatically engage. There it is. But if I put my foot down, ah, no, that, that should come out and it's not wanting to come out. Maybe that's what the extra switch is about. No, maybe that switch doesn't do anything at all, in fact. There should be like a kick down setup, so but if you push the throttle down for more pace, there it goes. It automatically comes out of overdrive. And then it cuts back in again as you lift. So that is working. But yeah, a bit of wind noise as you'd expect because we've got four opening quarter lights so that's not going to help plus this continent is not very kind the weather here is not kind to the um, window rubbers so they can get a bit leaky but I think they were always a little noisy oh it's a free wheel that's unexpected Yes, and now I don't really want it to be in overdrive, but um, it seems to like it there. And there's no way of disconnecting it without having to pull that back out again. But there's such torque, but it doesn't really matter. Here we are doing 30 miles an hour with the overdrive engaged, and it's just burbling along quite merrily. Uh, the steering is really quite good. I mean, uh, I haven't really remarked on it because it's kind of going where I want it to go. These were never, ever the finest handling cars, and they never really made any pretense at doing so in fact the um, the only way the Westminster managed to get any rallying glory for itself was when um, Pat Moss won the Liège Brescia Liège rally I think it was the Brescia one it might have been um, Sophia um, but um, yeah it was one of the big endurance rallies but she won in a big Healy and she only won because they managed to nick um, a gearbox plug from a Westminster um, because it, it fell out and uh, that was how they were able to continue um, they don't allow that these days but then there isn't much on a rally car that pickup was amazing oh there we go the overdrive has cut out uh, the, the, there's not much on a modern rally car you could nick off a production car because they're just 100 percent race cars different times amazing times and pat moss was an incredible woman yes apparently below 30 miles an hour in top it will just disengage the clutch and have a flywheel which means you can change gear without using the clutch allegedly might try that if we slow down a little more there we go now we're in second and I haven't touched the clutch pedal that's um, interesting it's an interesting thing about three wheel cars so you know all those two stroke cars uh, that have a free wheel um, you can sort of use it to change gear. This is a very jolly motor car. It's a bit bouncy. We've got um, good old leaf springs at the back. We've got coil springs with wishbones at the front. Um, despite sounding like that should be a recipe for good handling, Austin somehow ensured it didn't. Um, but um, it's, it's similar to the predecessors, but it, it is slightly revamped. I think there's um, a more anti-roll bar stuff going on uh, they are trying to make it a bit better 
um, than the predecessors. It's just it really wasn't close enough. No, I don't want the overdrive at that point. I've got the overdrive whether I want it or not. Yeah, I can see why. Ooh, that's a smash and a half. I can see why they moved to a different system where you just engage the overdrive when you actually want it. I suppose if you're around town, you'd probably pull your overdrive out and just save it for the um, open road. I don't know where we go. I think I'm just going to pull that out while we're in town. I think otherwise it's just going to get irritating. There's a strong smell in here of the vinyl. I'm looking at the pattern and it reminds me of the pattern vinyl on the Triumph 2000. That's another reason why I'm considering whether this might be an Australian assembled version because they would have had to build some components themselves to um, qualify for the necessary um, discounts to avoid the import quotas. So maybe that's how they did it, who knows. Yeah, she pulls well. That's us at the legal limit of 100. Or thereabouts, I'm not sure how accurate the speedo is. But she's got a bit more to give there, I would say. And it's only the wind noise that's really detracting from the experience. Um, would be fairly peaceful otherwise. My mirror has sadly moved. Yeah, that's not much use at all. Let's test how well the washers work at this speed. Uh, that's that button. There we go. Well, they, they smear a lot of um, screen wash at the bottom, don't they? But there's water just left all over the screen. But I can see where I'm going. It's cleaning this part in front of me very nicely indeed. Very unusual wiper movements you'll notice there. Oh, I do like torque. I can see why these cars would have gone down well here. Big, solid, lusty engines. Just what you want really, and you can fit the entire family in here. So that was the um, Austin Westminster A99. Um, a rather lovely car. I can see why they simplified the gearbox going forward, but um, yeah, a very enjoyable classic car, even if it was one which was pretty dated at the time it came out. But let's not judge it by the standards of the, the um, 1960s. Let's instead just say it's a very enjoyable car today. I would happily cover a great many miles in it. So I shall say, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go, and I shall see you in a future video. Farewell. It's got an additional electric fan, that's a bit fancy.